morning, good morning. Welcome to Revolution Church. Now, the first service, um, they are really quiet, so I need y'all to be a little bit more rowdy, a little bit more amen in, okay? Yes, okay. Um, thank you guys for being here on Mother's Day. You know, one of the things that I love um, about my mama, she is the best cook on the planet. I wish I got a slight ounce of her cooking skills. Um, I have yet to be able to make pinto beans without burning them, and I've never been able to be able to make, I've never been able to make a homemade biscuit ever, so we just buy frozen, which is such blasphemy in my mama's home. Um, so I can't wait to have a good dinner today at her house, um, so I'm excited for that. But if you are a woman, if you are a, you know, a college girl, or if you're single, or you want to be a mama, I want to celebrate you too. So if you're a woman in this place, would you stand up so we can honor you and clap for you? If you're a woman, stand up. Can we clap? Yes, 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 yes. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Some of you may be at that place where like you want to be a mama so bad. And what I know is there's been so many people, like I have an incredible mama, but I also have had women in my life been like spiritual mamas to me. So you are doing the work. You're being a spiritual mama to somebody. I know this morning when we got to church, uh, one of our sweet little boys, Dank, who lives in the community, he got here at seven o'clock this morning. And he was on his bike coming down the street. He came in and he had his shoes kicked off on the couch watching a Netflix. My mom had brought him a biscuit and he was living his best life. And I thought to myself, he was showing up because he wanted to be here. Like he wanted to be here to be around all the people. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm super thankful for this church. So if you will close your eyes with with me this morning and put your palms out in front of you. And I want you to um, ask yourself this question. Like this morning, as I'm sitting in here, maybe you didn't want to be here. Maybe you don't want to be here. I want you to ask the question, God, why in the world am I here? What is it that's coming, going to come from scripture this morning that I need to hear specifically from my heart? Because maybe you're in a really terrible place in your mind. I'm glad you're here. Maybe you're in a place where you're super numb against the things of God. Guess what? I'm glad you're here. And you may think that you got drug here, but God ordained you to be here. So I want you to lean into that and say, God, would you give me a word? Would you give me clarity? Would you give me healing? Whatever it is that from that, I want you to pray specifically just for a moment. God, we come to you, Lord, and we just say thank you, first of all, that we're able to freely walk into a building to worship you. God, I pray that you would allow our hearts to be positioned to a place to receive this morning, Lord. There's so many people that are in pain, and they're hurting, and they're angry, and they're they feel like they're limping, God, in this life. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to see through a new lens this morning, God, that we would walk out of here feeling stronger and bolder in your name. So we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Judges. We're going to hop in really quick because... When Richard's usually up here, I fuss at him if he goes over one minute over. And so last service, I had to watch that clock like a hawk because I was so worried I was going to go over. Um, so we're going to go jump in there. We're going to be excited, take notes, all of the things. So Richard and I just got back from Colorado, and it was the most amazing trip. My oldest daughter, Rebecca, she bought our plane tickets. She um, paid for our Airbnbs. Like she, the only thing she didn't do really was the food. And so it, we had such a great time. And while I would love to say that um, like our our favorite thing was about nature and animals. Like, I love seeing all the caribou. I was obsessed with it. I saw two bears while I was there. It was crazy. I only saw the bear bottoms. I also saw big old, literally, bear butts going down the mountain. But it was okay, because Richard wanted to throw them. He literally had beef jerky in his pocket and was dying to feed the animals. And one time, we saw a prairie dog on a leash, and he reached down, and I saw him feed that that little thing, um, beef jerky. But we also went to some weird and strange things too. Like we went to, um, to the setting Columbine High School, which was Rebecca was really young. We went there. We went to um, a couple people's houses that people had been murdered, which is so creepy. I know my husband is weird. Like I love caribou. He wanted to go all the weird spots. So we did. So we had a great trip. We're super thankful. But today's message, if you're taking note, is called Whatever It Takes. Because here's what I know, is that we're in a season where you have to choose. Am I going to follow Jesus with everything that I have, which is mind, soul, body, and spirit, everything, 
or I'm not. Because we have no more space where you could have one foot in and one foot out. That's over with. And so I know that as you're here this morning, I want, I'm hoping to push you in the direction of saying, hey, I'm going to go all in for Jesus. The definition of whatever is no matter what happens. No matter what happens, I will do whatever it takes to grow the kingdom of God. I'm going to Honduras next, next month, and I always have to think to myself, if I go into another country and something happens to me, am I okay with that? Because if I let fear be my friend, I'm not going to get on that plane. I was talking to someone just recently about Haiti and the conditions of Haiti, and it's terrible right now. One of the girls that usually is one of our translators, she called me last week like five times, and I finally answered the phone, and I was like, what's wrong? Her name is Hannah, and she's a beautiful girl, and she's like, Holly, I'm really scared. She's like, they're kidnapping left and right here, and they're robbing us, and they're all these different things, and she was terrified of it. She would, it's all going on in the city. Well, she lives probably two hours away from the city, but she's like, I'm not going into the city, so I need you to pray for provision for me. I don't have to have that fear. But you know what? I'm going to be back in Haiti. I will do whatever it takes to know that girl knows that she sees Jesus, right? Whatever it takes. Because here's the thing. I feel like we've been in a place, we've been merely existing for too long. We show up to ball games. We show up to work. We show up to this and that. And we're just existing. And John Piper said this. He said, you know, dolphins go after their food, but jellyfish... Just go with the waves and take whatever they can get in the waves. And I don't want to be a woman who just gets what she can. I don't want our church just to be floating in the direction of whatever, whichever the waves go, and we just grab on what we can. Because there's a culture out there with ideologies that are not from, this God, from God's word. And if you're acting like a jellyfish, you're going to take whatever it is and just believe it and keep going with it. So we have got to get to a place where we position ourselves to say, you know what, I'm going to go after the truth. I'm going to go after the things of God. I'm going to do whatever it takes to grow this kingdom. I don't want to be that person. So we're going to look at two women today, which I totally adore. And Judges chapter 4, we're going to start in verses 1 through 5. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazar, a Canaanite king, the commander of his army, was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagiam. Yeah. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, chariots, ruthlessly oppressed Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. The, Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. So the first person on the scene is Deborah, right? So we have Deborah, who is this woman who is the only woman judge in the entire Bible. She's the only woman judge and prophetess in the entire Bible. The only other person who has both those titles is Samuel. So Deborah is someone who has a direct connection to God. She hears his voice. She positions herself every day to be out under the palm of Deborah. And Israelites would line up to come to her to settle their disputes. Kind of like Judge Judy, but not Judge Judy. And I don't know if you remember this or not. Richard, a couple weeks ago, literally said, if something happens to Holly, I'll marry Judge Judy. And I'm like, of all the people, you're going to marry Judge Judy? But whatever. Okay. That was a totally sad note, but Judge Judy, but not, okay? So Judge Judy. And one of the things that I think about her is that, you know, this mindset of who Deborah was, like she was a worship leader. She was a songwriter. And this is coming on after Ehud, which we just read the very beginning, the first lines after Ehud's death. After Ehud, there was 80 years of peace. So there's 80 years of peace. But I want you to think about it. When we get really comfortable and we start doing, going back to our old ways of thinking and our old ways of life. Imagine how if each generation came and went. It got really lax. And here we are. At the end of the 80 years, he dies. And now the Israelites have done evil again. They're back into the same way of their thinking, the same way of their living. And now they're being harshly oppressed. A harshly oppressed. And what I love about Deborah is that she positioned herself above the noise to hear from God. She positioned herself above the noise to hear from God. You know, I was, she would go down and sit by the palm. The palm trees, they're literally, they, they're, they grow upward. They represent peace. Remember when Jesus rode in on a donkey, they waved their, waved their palm branches, right? 
It represents victory, represents, represents peace. And these Israelites needed peace. They were so oppressed. They were in this place. And I think about silence. So many times we're so afraid just to sit still in the presence of God. Because he may say, hey, you need to stop doing that. Or that person may need to be out of your life. Or, hey, you need to take a step in this direction in faith. So we try to drown out so much noise through relationships and friendships and things and buying stuff and doing stuff. It's constant, especially for women, I know. We drown it out, but we just need to be with the Father in silence. When we were in Colorado, we drove up the Rocky Mountain National Park, and you go in and let me see, you go through the little, um, you give them your little card thing or whatever. Random fact, Rebecca has an annual pass to national parks, which is the most random thing I've ever known in my life. But I'm glad she did. It was been 40 bucks. So we go through, and um, it's like silent. It's louder in this room than it was out there on the side of that mountain. And we just stood there, and we just looked out, and it was the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen in my life. And I, the, we kept saying this, pictures don't even do it justice. It's crazy. It's so beautiful. And it was so gorgeous, and it was so peaceful, and you could just feel it in your spirit, like, oh my gosh. Rebecca said, isn't it crazy how so many people don't believe in God, and yet we're looking at the most majestic view? That, like, it was amazing. And some of you are so afraid to be alone with God, but he wants to speak so much truth into you. And when I think about Deborah, I think about who she is, you know, things were put to the side so that she could be with God, just like with you. Social media can wait. That girlfriend can wait. That boyfriend can wait. Them dishes can wait. They wait in my, my sink almost all day long. But dishes can wait. Your kids can wait. There's things that can wait in your life so that you can connect with God. Because when you look at Deborah's life, she spoke from the Spirit and not from the flesh. She not only, she, that's when Israelites lined up for her, she was able to speak truth to them because she was directly connected to a holy God. Look verses 6 through 10. It says, um, One day she sent Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Natali. She said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun of Mount Ta at Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Keshon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun, Naphtali and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. So when I think about it, like she spoke boldly to this commander, right? This man who was a commander-in-chief, he led the army. And a woman who was a prophetess and a judge to say, I have a word for you. And so many times we hold back truth from people with a fear that something they're somehow going to walk away from us or somehow is going to not have their approval or somehow we're going to think that we're wrong. And that's not the case. When you speak this boldness out of a place of the Spirit, then it's motivated by the Spirit and not by your flesh. There's been times where I wanted to say something so bad and I want to lash back out. But that was from flesh. That was holly. That wasn't the Spirit of God. I had to shut my mouth. And that's what happens. And I think about it like Deborah spoke from the spirit, not from the flesh. And it made me think, are people listening to me? When I open up my mouth, does positivity come out of my mouth or negativity come out of my mouth? Does gossip come out of my mouth or building people up come out of my mouth? Am I a part of the solution or am I the problem? Am I constantly pointing people to Jesus or to the things of this world? If you're always complaining, if you're always being negative, if you're always, you know, arguing to prove your point, then how is that showing people who Jesus is? That's speaking out of the flesh and not of the spirit. Deborah spoke and people listened. And what is crazy, she knew, she knew where people were emotionally and physically in that time. She, every day they came to her with their problems and she heard where they were. She knew where they were emotionally and she knew where they were physically and she responded out of the spirit and not of the flesh. Which goes back, if you're not in God's word, you're not going to react out of the spirit. 
you're going to react out of your feelings and you're going to react out of your emotions. And that is not truth. That's your emotions. That's feelings. And if we look at Facebook, can't you see where people are around you? I mean, as soon as political season hit, you're like, oh, man, they're mad. Or wow, that person is in a really bad season right now. Wow, that person is really angry at so-and-so. Show up to a dance mom competition, not dance mom, dance competition. You'll see where mama's hearts are real quick. Or on the, on the, on the ball field sidelines. You can see the condition of where our people are. And Deborah saw that, but she spoke anyways. She said the hard things. She brought this place of a place of, of a spirit and not judge, not judgment. When you're walking and listening to the voice of God, you will see and respond differently. You just will. You respond differently. You don't respond out of a place of anger when you're connected to God through the spirit. You respond from a place of love. It's a spirit-led life versus a flesh-led life. Deborah also, if you look at verse 3, I mean where we were, Deborah also didn't hold back her obedience out of her fear or despite her opposition. She didn't hold back based on her fear or opposition. And she had an opposition. In verse 3, it reads so clearly, it says this. It says, Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots. How many? 900 iron chariots ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. She didn't hold back speaking speaking to Barak based on her fear of the opposition. She said it anyways. Hey, guess what? God is with you. You're going to go. You're going to call these people up, and you're going to have victory today. She didn't hold back based on her fear of the opposition, nor did she hold back a fear of approval or being wrong. Look at verse 8 and 9. It says, Barak told her, I will go only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. Here's what I know, is that she could have said, wait, I mean, what if I heard God wrong, and what if, I, what if that wasn't right? What if I hurt his feelings? What if, what if we no longer have, like, what if I lose my job? What if I... And all of a sudden, she could have talked her out of herself out of, a be, out of being obedient to a holy God based on her fear or op, of the opposition. And you allow things to come at us. I allow things to come at me where I stand and bow before fear instead of bowing for a holy God. And that's what Dot Deborah is doing here. I love it. Her words were laced without fear of offending, but instead with the power for conquering. She knew her words were coming straight from the mouth of God. So her, when it came out of her mouth, she knew that it was going to be victory. She didn't care who was offended. She told, dude, you're not going to get any honor, but it's going to fall to the hands of a what? A woman. And all the women said? Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't even say that in the first service. Y'all know wild crowd. Okay. But it made me think, what are you afraid of? Like, what are we afraid of? Are we afraid of being rejected? Are we afraid of pain? Are we afraid of being canceled? Are we afraid of being alone? Are we afraid of exposure? Are we afraid of losing comfort? Because that's coward thinking and not whatever it takes thinking. Because if I look clearly at God's word, the reality is, is God already chose you. So you saying that you're being rejected by people, that's not truth. That's your feelings. God already chose you. If you say that I'm, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to die, guess what? To die is gain. We get to be with the Father. If I go to Honduras, end up in heaven, hey, amen. My mama says not amen, but who cares if you're canceled? Jesus, if you're alone, Jesus is never going to leave you. Exposure, so what? Guess what? Healing and redemption gets to begin. And comfort is nowhere in this Bible. You can't show me one person who lived a life of comfort and a life completely and 100% holy for the kingdom. You can't show it to me. So the reality is you have to choose. And am I going to live this mindset of being a coward? Or am I going to live in this mindset of whatever it takes to grow the kingdom, to strengthen the kingdom, and to ready the kingdom? Look at verse 8. It says, Brack told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. I love that he wanted her to be there. And I think about, you know, Deborah, Deborah at that moment, she could have changed her mind. She could have said, you know what? I don't know if I'm, I don't know if this is the right. Maybe I should just let him go. 
But she didn't. He, she, the very next thing, she said, I will go with you. And this is what I know is don't change your mind by making up your mind. You're not going to change your mind if your mind is made up to fully and 100% solely follow God. You're not going to choose to walk in sin if you're wholly 100% whatever it takes mentality to follow, the God, to follow God and to grow the kingdom. Because you can't choose both ways. That's not a thing. You cannot choose the things of God and choose the things of this world. It's just not. You can't. Nowhere in Scripture can you show me that. You can't. Because what I know is that when our minds waver, we waver. If you're on the fence in any area of your life, it's like sitting in a car that's in neutral. You can go forward or you can go back. Somebody could push you and you can go forward or someone can push you and you could go back. You have to decide which way am I headed? Am I headed in drive? I'm going to go straight or I'm going to put it in reverse. I'm going to go back in the opposite direction of where God has called me to be. But that's thinking through the lens of whatever it takes, right? All right, let's look at back at verses 1 through 3 because I want to talk about the chariots for a minute. It says, how many chariots? 900. So, the purpose of the chariot was this battle to oppress these Israelites. There was this huge platform. I was looking at pictures of what it may would look like. And there's this huge horse out front. And someone's like, guard, like guiding the horse. And behind there is this huge platform with a soldier on it. And on the, where, there, where the platform was, was all the weapons. There's like bows and, you know, um, spears and whatever other weapons they had back in the day. But... They're on the back. And this person guiding the horse was guiding so the soldier could be free to fight. And so this mindset, there was the roadways were empty. These villages were abandoned. They had been harshly oppressing them. Could you imagine being with your small child or your husband or your friend, and all of a sudden you hear, <coughs> and you hear the shanking of metal because these were made of wood and metal and leather. And how much fear would come into you? It's like, oh no. And fear makes sense. Like, I get it. We get afraid when opposition comes at us. I get it. But just like Deborah showed up, so does God. Let's look at verse um, 9 through 16. It says, very well, she replied, I will go with you. Deborah said, I'm with you. Here's a voice, here's a word from God, but I'm going to be with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun, Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him, and Deborah also went with them. So she was with them. But I love it because God goes too. It says, Now Heber, the Kenai, a descendant of Moses, brother-in-law, Habab, had moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched his tent by the oak of Zanon near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his chariots, all his iron chariots, and all of his warriors, and they marched from that place to that place to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready! This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching where? Ahead of you. See, the reality is that, yes, Deborah showed up, but God was showing up because you know what? Chariots were useless in the mud. And every commentary that I read said, that, said it, obviously, this huge storm, rain must have come and filled up the valley because once the chariots hit the mud, they went nuts. They couldn't, they couldn't control it. They couldn't, they couldn't keep the horses from going one way to the next. It was mayhem. And what I know is that the enemy cannot win in God's territory. The enemy can't win in God's territory. This church is God's territory. Whether it's empty or not, this is God's territory, and he will grow the kingdom. Your marriage is God's territory. Your friendships are God's territory. Your mind is God's territory. Your business is God's territory. If you are a believer of Jesus, guess what? He already has gone before you. If you're not a mama yet, guess what? And you desire, he's already gone before you. Do you trust him in that? If you want to be married, do you trust him in that? Enemy cannot win in God's territory. Look at verse 16. 15, sorry. When Bar Barak attacked the Lord through Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Who threw it in there? The Lord. 
and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. So Sarah leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Heresher, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. The enemy will not win in God's territory. So whatever it takes means you speak from boldness. You say the, the hard things. You speak with uh, the spirit and not out of the flesh. You don't hold back your obedience based on your fear of the opposition. Because what I know when I read this, victory follows obedience. When you're wanting to walk in victory, see, we think victory is mountaintop, but victory sometimes very much is in the valley. We think that victory comes from this place of getting what we want through our prayer life. But victory may be in the mud and sticky and you still choosing to trust that God is God. Because when we're in situations and we look around, could you imagine the, the army going, what is happening? These people have 20 years, have held us down under their thumb. They're going nuts. But the Lord went before them. The Lord met them in the valley, right? And victory came to them. Now let's read Judges 17 through 24. This is real, gets real good. It should be a movie. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friend, friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor, which I could totally do a whole other message on this because I thought to myself, remember, they pitched their tents like away from the tribe, and she was friendly with the enemy. I could go all day on that, but I'm not going to go there today. Okay. Jael went to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in, don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and it covered him again. Stand at the door to the, of the tent, he told her. If anyone comes and asks if there's anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, this is who I want to be in my corner. Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and a tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. If I was ever going to get in a fight, I want this girl on my team. Like if I'm stranded on an island, I'm like, where is Jael? That's what I want with me because she's going to be killing all the things, and I will ride on the back of a bear. I know it. So on that day, Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king, and from the time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Jael was resourceful. She was likable. She was trustworthy, obviously. Hey, come into my tent. And there's a men's tent and there's a woman. Women have their own tents. So he said, hey, come into my tent. And he says, okay. So she's strong. She's brave. But you know what I noticed? That she used what she had. She had a blanket. She had some milk. And she had a tent peg. So I want you to hear me say this. Stop looking elsewhere for the tools you don't possess in this season. Here's the thing. Is you're looking for what you don't have. And is you don't have it on purpose. You don't have it on purpose. God used a woman in a tent that had a blanket some milk, and a tent peg. He asked for water, but she gave him milk. And what puts babies to sleep? Milk. And the mom on the front row said milk. You know, girl. It's milk. She was smart. She was wise. And although she was all those things, she was loyal. Even though her tent was pitched in a whole other area, she was loyal. She had watched the Israelites be oppressed. She was loyal to God. And some of us are keep continuously saying, I want to be loyal to the world because the world says be loyal to it. But God says, no, be loyal to me. See, Deborah didn't lift a voice, didn't lift a weapon. She lifted her voice. Deborah didn't come out with it with a sword swinging or with a tent peg about to kill somebody. She lifted her voice. She spoke up. And Jael didn't lift her, her voice. She lifted a tent peg, which is her loyalty. And some of you are in a season where all you have maybe is your voice. Use it. But some of you have giftings that you need to be using. Some of you need to say, you know what? I'm a single in this moment for a reason. Let me use what God has given me in this season and be okay with that. 
Because the reality is there's so many people in this world who call themselves believers and they've been sucking on a bottle for way too long. They don't open their Bibles. They don't pray. They don't lean into the truth of God's word like a jellyfish is going and going. And it's time to put the bottle away. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was keeping Kate and a friend of mine's little boy, and she's like, we we're trying to stop the bottle. So you can get, and I was like so excited. I just got him to love me. So I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to give this kid this bottle. But then I said, no, I'm not going to do it. So I put him in there. He screamed for about five minutes. And then he, he went straight to sleep. And guess what? Now he don't have a nap time bottle. He graduated to no more nap time bottle. And some of you need to graduate from your spiritual baby milk. God has so much more for you. He has dreams for you. He's got passions he's putting inside of you. But if you're sucking on a baby milk, then you're going to act like a spiritual baby. And it's time to move on to some steak. All the men say, steak? You don't like steak? That's what I'm having for dinner today. Praise the Lord. But he asked for a spiritual baby. I mean, she asked, he asked for water. She gave him milk. I think it's time that we wake up as a generation because when I think about my girls, I don't want my girls to, to look to my life and never once see me praying. I grew up in a home where my mama got on my nerves reading her Bible. Like, he got on my nerves. I could hear her sipping her coffee at 5 a.m., and I could hear them Bible pages turning, and it drove me out of my mind. And there weren't no sound machines back in my day. Or earphones, maybe the big headphones, but there wasn't that in the back of the day. But you know what? It's so funny. It's because now I get up at 5 in the morning. I can't wait to be with the Father. I watch my mama do it. And here's the thing is that we have a generation. I look at the Israelites and all these 80 years, somebody loosened up. Somebody got lax in their thinking. Somebody got lax to the things of God. And then the next generation paid for it. 20 years of deep oppression. That's a lot. I don't want my girls to grow up and say, what does this even mean? There's so many different transportation. There's so many different ways people are um, interpreting the Bible now. Like, which one is right? Wow, this was wrong in this day, but now it's right in this day. Here's the thing: is this thing never changes. The God's word will never change. It's the only thing that is true and true, and will never change. But it starts in your heart, and you have to believe that and stand on that. And I believe that our identity is, is being attacked. I believe that our, our dreams are being attacked. I believe our marriages are being attacked. I believe our singleness is being attacked. I believe our joy is being attacked. I believe our families and our values and our beliefs. And I believe the church is being attacked from the opposition, saying, you know what, you're no longer relevant. That's not true. I got here this morning, a seven-year-old kid who's in the second grade was out there on his bicycle ready to get in this church. We are relevant. The body of Christ is relevant you know, our freedom in Christ is the framework in which we are li to live set apart. Like when Jesus died on the cross for your sins and said, you know what, I'm going to redeem you from your life, from hell. I'm going to redeem you from that. I want you to be with me in, in heaven. That moment happened, you became free in Christ. And that became the framework in which you do everything to live opposite of, of how you used to live. Not behavior modification, but surrender. Like just completely surrender to the things of God. You know, 180... A couple weeks ago, I was um, at 180, and I had passed out glasses to all of my girls for illustration. And it was crazy because, um, sorry, I broke these in the first service, and I broke them again. Okay, there we go. Richard always breaks his glasses, so I'm doing that, right? Okay, so when I think about it, I told everybody to put their glasses on. Sorry, I broke it again. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, so I put them on. And I can see you, right? I can see you, not 100% clearly, but I can see you. And I can, I can do like this. I can look through the thing. I can see where everybody's sitting. But I called one of the girls up, and I said, tell me what keeps you from seeing God. And she said something, and we took a piece of tape, and we taped it over here. And, but I kept pushing. I'm like, okay, well, let's don't say insecure. What are you insecure of? And things popped up like, I don't feel pretty enough. So the sin is that you don't believe that God says who you say you are because he says you're a masterpiece. Well, I don't believe that I'm ever going to have a relationship. I believe that no boy's ever going to like me. So you believe you're not good enough. So we kept 
literally getting down to the source of what this insecurity even represented. Because you can say you're insecure all day long, and that's a mask, and that will get you nowhere. But exposing darkness for what it is will get you to the place of healing and restore. And so I was sitting there, and they put their glasses on, and, and I began to just to think. And I was like, okay, go ahead and start taking that tape off. And she tried to take, and I got somebody else to help her, and she was pulling the tape up. And I said, Jocelyn, why don't you just take them off? And we were like, oh. It was like funny because we all they took their glasses off. And I'm reminded of the story in Acts chapter 9 with Saul, who was this, this man who was this zealot. He was so on fire for religion and rules, and he followed the rules so like, in and day, in day in and day out. And he had a conversion. He encountered a holy God, and he fell to his knees, and he couldn't see anything. And he goes to this house, and this man, Ananias, said, the Lord says, I want you to go, and I want you to lay hands on this man. And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, don't you know who we're talking about here, God? See, he almost bowed to the fear of the opposition. He almost bowed and held back, but he didn't. And he goes, he lays hands on him, and it says something like scales fell off of Saul's eyes, which is now Paul who wrote the New Testament, basically. I'm so glad that Ananias followed through in obedience. I'm so glad that Deborah spoke up. I'm so glad that Jael drove that tent through that man's skull. But here's the thing is, we're sitting in a, in a place in this generation and we have stuff that's clouding our vision from seeing a holy God clear because we have self in the center. And we were never meant to bow down to self, but only to God. Whatever it takes isn't just about removing or hold, hiding. It's about killing it. She could have said, hey, I'm going to hide you in here for a little while. And then you can leave. Because they were friends, remember? They are friendly. Hey, I'm just going to keep you in here just for a little while. And then you can go. But she knew that he had to die. She knew that he was the head of what was coming and oppressing Israelites. He had to die. I think back in August when I, um, I got on the scales for the first time in a while. And I just dropped Rachel off at school. And I weighed the, the, the biggest I'd ever weighed. And it was one of those like, gut check moments like, oh, wow. And I had dieted and pretty much my whole, literally since I had Rebecca, I've been on this diet, constant diet. And I think about all the, the years of just like diet, no diet, starve myself, you know, eat too much, throw up, take diet pills. That's a lot of hiding. That's a lot of removing and putting to the side. But it, once I surrendered it and killed it, like I killed the desire for sugar in my life, I began to see things change in my life. I suddenly... I don't care what people think. Suddenly, I saw 53 pounds come off of me. <laughs> Suddenly, food is not like this like source of encouragement for me anymore. See, what you think is that boy is going to keep you going. What you think is that addiction is going to keep you sustaining or that fear is going to keep you from ever moving out and moving in a different direction, but it's not. It's going to drive you into the mud and you're going to go running because when fear hits, we run. You've got to drive truth through it. Put that truth of who God is and what he says through the center of what you're struggling with and watch what happens. In Isaiah 54, 2 through 3, it says this, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Look at your neighbor and say, don't hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. What are your stakes in this morning? If it's on fear, if it's on the shame of your past, if it's on lies, ideologies that are not from God's word, if it's on emotions or feelings, then that's not driving your stakes down deep into the word. When we go to Haiti, I remember the first time I ever went, and we went to this one village, and 
it was all like a tent village and like there's like plastic tarps and they had sticks going in and so when the rain came and the hurricanes came the next time I went they were not there anymore they weren't deeply permanently into the foundation and I love what it says it says enlarge the place of your tent there shouldn't be an empty seat in this place Enlarge the place of your tent. Pull back the stakes. Swing wide. Don't hold back. If you lose friendships, you lose friendships. If you have to be a single in a season, you have to be single in a season. If you have to say, you know what, I'm going to cut these people out of my life because I cannot not be an addict around them, then cut those people out of your life. Because we serve a holy God and He wants you to do whatever it takes And he's going to lengthen it. He's going to show blessing. He's going to pour out your favor. You know, Teresa, who's in my life group, she said something a couple weeks ago that was so profound. And we were talking about, I don't even know what we were talking about. All I can just hear her voice saying, we have to stop feeding it. I was like, yes. You have to starve that thing that continuously is pulling you back to be something that you're not. Stop feeding social media. Stop feeding this idea that you're not good enough. Stop feeding the fear. Stop feeding these ideologies that are not from God. Stop feeding those things. Starve them out so that they're no more. We have to to get to the place of if we're going to rise up so that we can mount up, so that we can soar. I think about an eagle and the spread of his wings goes so far, but it has to rise up. It doesn't fly on the ground. It has to rise up. It has to mount up. Then it soars for a long ways. If you'll bow your heads with me. There's people in this room that you've been living literally with one foot in this idea that you want to live this life for God. And this other foot that you're so just like done and apathetic and maybe you're just not even understanding who God even really is. For you, I'm saying it's time to, to, to deepen your stakes. Maybe it's time for you to pick up that tent peg and kill it. These lies that the enemy keeps continuously putting into your mind. So what I want to ask you this morning, and I asked the first service, is that are you willing to do whatever it takes for Jesus? Like whatever it takes, whatever happens, if that means that you never, ever get married, are you going to do whatever it takes to grow the kingdom? If that means if you never, ever have money in the bank or a car or a child or a dream come true, on this side of earth, are you still going to serve God with everything that you have? Whatever it takes. If that's you this morning, you're willing to say, Holly, I'm ready to do whatever it takes. Would you stand to your feet? Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Yes, yes, yes. Whatever it takes, yes. Then you know what that means? There's got to be some things that you need to have to hand over to Jesus. And maybe that's a lifestyle. Maybe that's a thought. Maybe that's the way you speak to people or about people. Maybe that's how you interact within your relationships. I don't know what that, I don't know what yours is. I don't know what mine is. And I have to ask myself this too. Like, am I doing whatever it takes to follow Jesus? Because of approval of man it's more important than following God that I'm not and if I'm so afraid to lose something when I gain so much more on the other side of heaven then I'm not doing whatever it takes if you're here this morning and you never received Jesus as your personal savior man today is be a beautiful day on Mother's Day today's a great day for me to be able to celebrate motherhood celebrate my mom but it's also a day my dad was killed 23 years ago today And it's a weird feeling. It's like one of those weird, like, moments where you're like, wow, what would he be doing right now? Would I, you know, we had just started our relationship. So some of you, you're holding on to so much anger and bitterness, and you've got to let it go, man. It's not worth it. It's poison to our souls. 
So if you've never received Jesus as your Savior, it's simply admitting, hey, I'm a sinner. And it's turning away from that and receiving Jesus and allowing him to, to be the center of your life. And if that's what, something that you feel that stir in your heart this morning in the back, our care team would love to walk you through what that looks like. Or maybe you're just hurt and you're mad and you're angry and you need someone to talk to. Guess what? They're ready for you and they're prayed up. But the rest of you who stood up and said, I want to do whatever it takes, I want you to worship from a place of victory, not in the mud, but in a place of victory. Because we win. Look at your neighbor and say, we win. Right? We might not feel it, but we win. That was like Richard Florida State all way. We didn't win nothing, but we felt like we won. He still wore the, you know, the stuff. But we win. Let's pray together. God, we receive newness this morning. We receive hope. We receive joy. We receive love. We receive healing. We receive freedom in your name, God. Lord, I pray for the, these people, these men and women who stood up to say, I want to do whatever it takes for the kingdom. God, I pray that you stir a, a roaring lion in their souls, God, that they will speak from a place of spirit and not of flesh. They will drive, your holiness would drive out sin in their life, God, and they can receive joy in such a new and powerful way. God, we love you, and we give this day to you. Amen.